Welcome to Lock and Key Unlocked, a podcast about the comic Lock and Key by Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez and the upcoming Netflix series of the same name. Oh boy, guys, we Get are about to it. talk about Lock and Key, Keys to the Kingdom, Keys which I to say, the kingdom. without exaggeration, is the most important most crucial volume of Lock and Key. I uh, think we here can we fucking go. This is not. That's this. not necessarily true, Alex. I mean, listen. There's some huge revelations in here, uh, and definitely a huge character introduction. That w- what do we have? A couple of hours, like five or six hours, to really get into this. Get into what happens in this volume. Uh, the characters that are introduced. Yeah. Uh, I don't really have anything to say about it. Are you talking about the character you're talking about is the pool of dog urine in the first issue, right? (laughs) No, but similar to that, Dr. Zalbin is Ah. introduced to the last issue. Uh, Just to jump ahead, I just wanted to get it out there at the beginning. I have been looking forward to this the entire time. It is such a joy, and I can't wait to hear both of you really go in on this character. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I do have some notes. Yes. Uh, But before we do, I I do have a bunch of notes about the episode. We'll do a quick recap of what's happened so far. And then we're going to jump in issue by issue. Pete, this is important. There's lots of stuff going on. So Lock and Key Keys to the Kingdom, published by IDW, written by Joe Hill, art by Gabriel Rodriguez, colors by Jay Photos, and letters by Robbie Robbins. The miniseries was originally released between August 11th, 2010 through April 27th, 2011. I do think it's interesting to note that this is the shortest gap between miniseries, between Crown of Shadows and this one, where usually there was a couple of months between the end of one and the beginning of the other. This one went straight from July to August. Uh, I don't know if necessarily there's a reason for that. I wasn't able to find that in any interviews, Pete. Any uh, clips you watched online that maybe nope. would illuminate that? No, not at all. I don't know what I you're talking about. Pete, did, uh, you re-watch, did you rewatch the same two and a half minute um, video <laughs> interview that you've been rewatching? No, there's a I new one. There's a new one. I don't appreciate this attack on my research. All right. <laughs> well, did you, uh, I'm just curious, Pete, did you, when you were researching, did you find any other interviews? Because there was a really fascinating, really good in-depth interview I found from, um, I want to say it's MTV Geek from around this time about mm-hmm. this uh Keys to the Kingdom volume. It was by a uh, sharp young journalist named Alexander Zalbin uh, who did it. There we go. So, <laughs> did you, you, did, you're just going to be stroking your own dick this whole show? <laughs> like, what's going on? Uh, can I tell you, perfect honesty, when I played through this conversation here at the beginning of the podcast in my head several times in the week since we taped the last one, uh, <laughs> the word that keeps coming up was insufferable. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> let's get into it. Uh, back yeah. to back to it, though. Uh, this is the shortest gap between the miniseries. Uh, well, let me say the, on that, I do think yeah. uh, it makes sense to me why they would sort of string these together back to back. The action is rising uh, so intensely mm-hmm. here. And this is the one, this is the volume that really opens up the world and really gets us into the full scope of what we're dealing with with Key House, I feel like. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's also, there is a gap later on, which we'll get to in a moment, actually in the middle of the miniseries. Uh, but as you mentioned, this is the end of Act 2. Uh, and there's a different sort of structure here. There's four related almost one-shots uh, and then a two-part story at the end. Uh, and they did mention in the interview that I did with him, which I had a complete blank of doing, uh, but that the idea Wait, you here forgot is, you interviewed them? No, I didn't forget. I got inter- Listen, man, this was years ago at this point. I've done so many interviews with so many oh, celebrities. Big time. Turn it I down. I was just asking you a fucking question. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I don't need your whole fucking resume. Uh, wow. Well, I started off interning in the literary department of Playwrights Arise. I actually would like to see your resume, Alex. <laughs> you Please. did we we I sent that to you when I got hired for this podcast, right? Yeah. I how often do we come up in your resume? Your boys, uh, Justin and Pete. <laughs> Your you're boys. right at the front. You're under. You're under skills, <laughs> special yeah. skills, managing yes. Justin and Pete. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they did say that part of this was to the point that you were making, Justin, that they are really getting to it. And even though we have two volumes left, 
those really are the climax of the whole story. They were packing in as many keys and as many different story modes as possible because this was going to be their chance to play with things, lay down as much information as possible because it's basically whatever it is, wheels to the road or any, I don't remember the expression uh, at uh, the end. When here. the rubber hits the road. Thank Perhaps. you. That's what the actual expression is. Or maybe you're saying something else. Uh, yeah, maybe nope. you're the horse they rode in on. Well, it's interesting. It's, that I've noticed this when I was reading this, um, especially the second issue in this volume, that there, this series has such a pace that you're like, oh, my God, they have to cram it all in. Mm-hmm. Like, like why uh, so many other comic series or like stories that we tell are just like expansive, especially in the comic book mm-hmm. industry. It's like they start a story and it can go anywhere. They can take all the time they want in the world to tell their story. This story always felt like it's running out of time. There's only a certain number of issues and only a certain amount of space to cover all of this huge world. And I think that adds so much enjoyment of it because it's like a precious resource. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, Oh, go ahead, Pete. I also think that like what's interesting is instead of it being like, holy crap, we have to jam this all in. Let's just get it done. They still with each issue, with each kind of volume, it, there's so much many different creative choices and so many different storytelling methods that it's really impressive to see them handle all of this stuff in such a creative, fun way. Yeah, this, this whole volume is great, and I'm excited to chat about the individual Except issues. Except for the weird doctor scene that was not important at all. But I mean, that's the most important scene. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, first, though, around the same time in April, right before the release of the final issue, Lock and Key was nominated for multiple Eisner Awards, which, if you're listening and don't know what those are, those are the most prestigious award in the comic book industry. They usually give it out at San Diego Comic-Con, not by San Diego Comic-Con, but in a related event. Uh, the f- Here's the awards they were nominated for. The first issue of Keys to the Kingdom, Sparrow, which is superb, was nominated for Best Single Issue or One Shot. Interestingly, yep. it was going up against Hill's own The Cape at IDW, which is also very mm. good, uh, but a very different story. Uh, Joe Hill was also nominated for Best Writer for Lock and Key and Gabriel Rodriguez for Best Penciler Inker or Penciler Inker Team. And it was also nominated as a whole for Best Continuing Series. Uh, Now, it ultimately only went on to win one of those awards, Best Writer for Joe Hill. But before Pete gets very retroactively angry about it, I also wrote down uh, what actually won. Uh, and Scotty Young won Best Penciler Inker for Marvelous Land of Oz. Okay, which I think all is right, right, all right. right. But still, give her best a continu- Hold on. Best Continuing Series went to Chu. Wow, wow. really? Yeah. Damn. Uh, and, That's uh, also best single, really good. Best Single Issue or One Shot went to Mike Mignola and Richard Corbin for Hellboy Double Feature of Evil. Fuck. So I feel like it was so funny reading wow. these over because I was like, man, this is a real Sophie's Choice for Pete going on here. Yeah. God damn. Uh, all your all favorites. Very good. Yes. It was a we renaissance. Hell of a year for comics. Hell of a year for comics. Ten uh, years now, ago, Pete, it was your time. Over at the same time, as we talked about in the last episode of the podcast, lots of stuff was going on from the TV movie perspective with Lock and Key at the same time. In particular, there were some big moves that happened while Keys to the Kingdom was being released. Uh, we left it off that Alex and Kurtzman and Robert Orsi, uh, Roberto Orsi, excuse me, had nabbed the rights for the property from Dimension Films, moved it over to DreamWorks. The rumor at the time had been for a film, but after a little bit of digging, I found out that wasn't actually true. Uh, It was always intended. They were always pitching it and working it as a TV show. But August 2010, right after the first issue was released, on around August 23rd, some big news was 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 released via the trades, uh, which is that Steven Spielberg had boarded the project as an exec producer with Josh Friedman, who is showrunner on the excellent Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles, was writing the pilot mm-hmm. and expected to run the writer's room. Uh, and this wasn't officially announced, but Spielberg, Kurtzman and Orsi uh, were working on a bunch of projects together, including what at the time was highly anticipated, turned out to be kind of terrible. Uh, they were working on Terra Nova together. You remember the dinosaur time travel show? Yeah, I watched the shit out of that show. <laughs> no, right? Not great. 
Not great. Uh, but people were very excited about that. They were pretty hot off the pitch for that. Uh, so they were expecting it to go to Fox. Uh, and in fact, Fox did pick up lock and key under a series commitment, not a series or straight to series order, but a series commitment, uh, which meant that if they didn't like the pilot, they could opt not to pick it up, but would have to pay millions of dollars to 20th Century Fox, which, yes, they're part of the same company, but it's still you don't want to do that. So yeah. uh, it would have been a big problem if the pilot didn't get picked up. I think you know the way this is going, but kind of hold on to that info for later. Uh, over the course of the release of Keys to the Kingdom, uh, things continued to pick up speed on the Fox pilot. Miranda Otto, who we know very well from Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, among other things, joined as Nina Locke. Sarah Bolger joined as Kinsey. Nick Stahl was cast as Duncan Locke. And... Uh, uh, he's not a rocker musician. Jesse McCartney was cast as Tyler, which is a very different take on the character. And Cassidia Solo, who is a geek icon, joined as Dodge. Uh, and I, remember I mentioned The Gap. January 26, 2011, issue number four was released. And then issue five came out on March 2nd, 2011. Now, of course, they put the issues together far in advance. But February was when the pilot was filming and Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez headed to set. They were hanging out on set. So if I remember correctly, and this is a very foggy memory, uh, but I believe they actually put that gap in there so that they would have time to be on set and not have to worry about the series being released. Um, yeah. But also at that time when they were on set, they came up with plans for how to end the series and figured out a little twists and changes they could make, which is kind of neat. Worth so it pilot- for all of the millions in penalty paid when they didn't pick it up exactly. that they figured out how the series ended. <laughs> exactly. Um, Mark Romanek was picked up as the director and they directed it over February, not in Massachusetts where the show is set, uh, but in Pittsburgh as well as other parts of Pennsylvania. Mm. Pittsburgh is where they found the perfect key house. Uh, and by the Pittsburgh end of February, Pittsburgh is the Massachusetts of Pennsylvania. Yes, that's what everybody what? always says. Uh, production had wrapped by the end of February, and a decision on whether to pick it up for fall 2011 would be made by May. And that's where we'll leave off with this one. We'll pick up with the insanely complicated media history of Lock and Key next time. Let's jump into some Jeez. recap for the book first, Pete. Jeez. Sorry, oh, Pete. Christ. Sorry to give so much information. I know this is killing you. That's what we are here for. Justin I love this. can just sleep and wake us up when you're fucking done, man. No, Pete, you need to listen. This is this is great information about a series and uh, show that we love. Exactly. And Pete, if you wanted to find out more, you should have uh, watched the two minute and 30 second long clip that Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez taped specifically about Keys to the Kingdom. But I guess you're just slacking this episode. I am slacking. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. <laughs> It's not like you have anything else going on in your life. So let's jump into recap for Lock and Key. Uh, the Lock family moved to Lovecraft, Massachusetts after the death of Rendell Lock, the uh, patriarch of the family. Uh, when they got there, they discovered a bunch of magical keys and an evil entity named Dodge who was looking for those keys, specifically one key called the Omega Key that can unlock something called the Black Door. We don't know a whole lot about the Black Door yet, uh, but in order to get the Lock family, he sent a guy named Sam Lesser first to kill Rendell and then to try and kill the rest of the family. But instead, uh, Sam Lesser himself was killed by Dodge, who took Sam Lesser and threw him through something called the ghost door, separating his soul and his body. Uh, Through various confrontations with the Locke family, they've discovered more about Dodge, who uh, they still think is a lady, but has actually taken on the identity of Zach Wells, a high school student. Dodge looks like a lady. (laughs) We'll release that as a bonus track, I think. And uh, Dodge is masquerading as a guy named Zach Wells. He is dating Kinsey, one of the members of the Locke family, uh, when he is actually a boy named Lucas Caravaggio, who back in the day was friends with Rendell Locke. Things went very horribly wrong back in the day when Rendell was a teen and when Lucas was a teen. Uh, As we found out in the last volume, Lucas isn't really Lucas at all. He's actually an echo from the well just off Key House that is a strange monstrous entity that seems to be attached to his spine in some way. Uh, and he is looking for these keys. Other things that you should probably know, uh, there is a friend of Bodhi, the youngest of the Locke family named Rufus. Rufus is autistic or on the autism spectrum. Uh, and Rufus mostly talks through his action figures 
He knows that Zach is Dodge. Dodge has threatened his mother, Ellie, who was also friends with Rendell and Lucas back in the day. In fact, she was friends with Lucas. Uh, and Lucas slash Zach has messed around in her head. He, he has kind of felt around in there and removed most of her memories. So she's really just a shell of her former self. Uh, what else do you need to know? You probably need to know about Uncle Duncan Locke. Duncan mm. Locke uh, was... Uh, attacked, followed by his boyfriend, Brian, who was run over by a car and knocked unconscious. Uh, Duncan seems to be missing some of his memories, though he also seemed to remember that Zach wasn't who he says he was after he had been hit with a bottle back in a bar fight, uh, though he didn't get to tell Tyler, who is the oldest lock kid, or anybody else any of that information. So they're one off in Provincetown. Th- one yeah. notable thing there, Brian, uh, Duncan's boyfriend, before he was hit by the car mm. and put into a coma, saw Dodge in their house, Zach Wells in their house. Yes. And he doesn't know him. So very confusing for him. Uh, Let's see. What else can we tell you? Uh, Tyler is crushing hard on a girl that I have completely blanked on. Jamie. Jamie. Jamie? No, it's not Jamie. It's uh, something else. Jordan. 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 Yes, it was a J name. Uh, He is crushing her hard on a girl named Jordan, uh, who other people have described as a psycho bitch. He also has a dude lacrosse player friend, who I also am blanking on the name of. Uh, Kinsey has two friends that she pals around with. Scott, who is the Spider Jerusalem-esque punk dude who is in love with her. And there's Jamal Saturday, who is Scott's friend, who also... Uh, is kind of in love with her. They smooched back in a place called the Drowning Caves when they thought they were going to die, so there's a little bit of stuff bubbling there. Kinsey, we should also mention, used something called the head key to take out her fear and sadness, so she's not feeling a whole lot these days. And I'm sure there are more things. Oh, Nina Locke also had a huge revelation towards the end of the last volume. Uh, She was... An alcoholic, uh, she hit in the sauce pretty hard. Some secrets and truths came out about her. She tried to bring Rendell back using something called the mending key. It didn't work. And she very much hit rock bottom, which is something that she is recovering from throughout this volume. So with that set up out of the way, there's more things that we'll probably talk about. Uh, but let's jump into it. And I think for this podcast... Holy rather- shit. Uh, calm down, Pete. Rather than flipping through page by page, why don't we go issue by issue? Because they are so yeah. specific with the story. Kick it off with the first issue, Sparrow. Which my is one favorite of my... issue. Is this your favorite issue of the entire series, Pete? Yeah, it's the Calvin and Hobbes ode. And uh, yeah. I'm a huge Calvin and Hobbes fan. Bill Watterson, what up? Um, so, yeah, I, I just uh, this was my favorite. Yeah, so, I had forgotten that this issue kicked off the uh, this arc. It's such a like big choice to kick off your whole new big story arc with such a strong art homage, uh, but very cool. Yeah, and the four yeah, panels so all- with the big background is such a mm-hmm. fun creative choice to make. Yeah, so if you're not specifically looking at it, it's four panels placed vertically versus uh, three three or four panels across, like actual Calvin and Hobbes. And in the background is a big full-page panel that's obstructed by this four-panel grid. But the thing that is phenomenal about it is they're still telling the story with the background panel. So the way that yep, you yeah. read it, or the way, the way that I read it, is you start with the top panel, go all the way down, and then you look at the back panel as almost the fifth panel, and it, it, it's amazing. And yeah. I think I feel like we're lulled into this uh, sense of security that the background art is just like window dressing. But then suddenly, as the story unfolds, we get big story points, hap- like a lot of silent action happening in the, the under panel, which is just great. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing to mention that I had kind of forgotten is all of Bodhi's stuff which is about him trying to make friends and turning into a bird, thanks to the animal door, is told in the style of Calvin and Hobbes, but everything else is told pretty realistically uh, to the point yeah. where there's Dodge uses the animal door to change into a dog, slaughters this entire uh, flock of sparrows using his uh, pack of wolves, uh, and that's bloody and huge and disgusting, but that's told in the slightly more realistic style We also talked a couple of episodes back about how Gabriel Rodriguez said he was going to try to mature his style over the course of the series, just as the kids grow older. And I think we had wondered about that when we were talking about the first volume, I think. Uh, That is very readily apparent here in this volume. 
Yeah, on the very last page, um, we get this um, fade from the Calvin and Hobbes style into the more realistic art style. And that sort of transition alone, I feel like, required so much control to do. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really impressive that somebody can go back and forth between a cartoonish type style and the realism of the story and still have it kind of hit you and you feel it and uh, it it's just such a great way to kind of move this story forward. The other thing that I love from the writing perspective that Joe does is when you are in this Calvin and Hobbes style, he builds it towards jokes. Like if they work yeah. as individual comic strips, which I think is so much fun. You also get uh, little Easter eggs for the horrible snowmen that Calvin always builds throughout yeah. the issue, which is also very fun. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to mention that I thought was kind of neat at the very end, and this is very much jumping ahead to the last two issues, but Tyler ultimately figures out that who Dodge is, or at least uh, he figures out a good portion of it. And the clue that he reveals, which Dodge calls him out on, and he says, how did you figure out? And he says, balls. And Dodge yeah. is like, oh, classic Tyler, saying stupid shit until the end. But Tyler's like, no, when you were a wolf, the wolf had balls. And that made me yeah. think, wait a second, what if this isn't a lady? What if this is a man or somebody who could change back and forth? And I don't think you necessarily see like dangling wolf balls at any point of the issue. I was flipping. Nobody through pees it like a bo- he pees like a boy dog. And you exactly. gotta always exactly. you gotta always watch that dog pee. Always, well, no I matter think- in your real life, watch that dog pee. There are clues there. Mm-hmm. What? That's I. What always- are you telling people to do? Every time a dog pees, I just jam myself on that undercarriage and I check it out. Oh like, my aha, god, that's a boy. When you say <laughs> jam yourself, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah, I think you could picture it and figure it out. Oh, yeah, no, I could man. draw. I could draw a picture of it in a fun Calvin and Hobbes style. <laughs> yes. The other thing, and I know you guys are going to lump on me for me calling back to this interview, but uh, we had touched on the Alan Moore Watchmen of it all. Uh, a volume or two back when we were chatting about it. And in the interview from MTV, I'd again forgotten that Joe said this, but he said that he was more only second to one other writer in his life that he did not mention, who did not name, who you can imagine is his dad, Stephen King. Uh, Alan Moore is the writer who inspires him the most. And just in terms of structurally, again, he felt like this is the time to really fuck shit up and like play around with it and really just... He he said, uh, try all the positions in the Kama Sutra on the comic book form. So I think that's what you see them what? doing here. That's what he yeah. said, man. So, and I think that's true. Like, every issue is very much its own thing. And I love that that plays yep. out here because the, we'll get to it in a moment, but there's so many other comic book calls outs throughout this volume. It's very fun. And I just love the way they must have gotten there. Like, let's, like, thinking critically about, like, okay, how do we want to tell this Bodhi story? And having it be like, oh, what if we, what's an art choice we can make? And getting to Calvin and Hobbes and really playing that up and having it. Be able to, like you said, jump back and forth between the the humor of it and then the like big revelations of like Kinsey's dating Dodge, um, just Dodge being evil. I, there's a random Werewolves of London reference. Uh, all the the gore on juxtaposed with this like super sweet Calvin and Hobbes story, like that stuff. You can just feel the thinking in the best way. Like it's just a series of smart decisions. It's uh, so hard to, to uh, imagine them coming to. And then you get this heartbreaking moment at the end where Bodhi sees all of the birds. The, the balance and just like sh- tone shifting they do is, is in each issue is amazing. Yeah, it is pretty fantastic. One other thing that I wanted to mention that I think I spent too much time on with the last issue is those last three panels where Tyler is sitting under the statue and then it pans up to a tree and you see the leaf coming off and then it's just the sky. Uh, Certainly there's metaphorical things going on there, but I also think they're just setting up that this volume takes place in winter. Like it's fall, the seasons are transitioning and it's a way of keeping time, Uh, which struck me when I picked this up and I was like, oh, okay, all right, I get it. Uh, So that's the first issue. Let's talk about the second issue, which is titled White. 
And this deals with some big plot stuff going on here. Uh, we specifically find out about Aaron Voss, which is a character that we've heard mentioned a couple of times throughout the volumes. She was a friend of Rendell Ox uh, and Lucas and Ellie Whedon's. Back in the day, we've heard that she was in The Crazy House. She was in The Lunatic Asylum. There's been some thought about, oh, maybe we should find out where she is. But this issue, just simply by walking by... They bump into her and we get we get a little bit of like a, not a little bit, but a big twist here where we see Erin. She could barely say words. She when we first see her, she sees Zach and says, da, Dodge, Randall, Dodge, Dodge. And they don't understand what she's saying. Uh, and then she starts shouting, no, white, white, white. And we get two racist groundkeepers who are like, oh, man. She's calling out us out on our whiteness all the time. But of course, there's a swerve there by the end of the issue. But the majority of the issue is taken up with Kinsey trying to track down and get to Aaron while Dodge is doing the same thing. Uh, And the other thing that we get here is we get uh, I'm forgetting what it's called. It's hold on. I'm going to flip to the end here because I want to get the name right. But yeah, the skin key, which allows you to change your skin color. This is a yeah. very ballsy thing yeah. for anybody to do at any issue, How, which it changes the color of your skin, and it ultimately allows Kinsey and Bodhi to become African-American and find out a little bit about that experience and ultimately sneak into the insane asylum that way. What do you think about this move? Uh, I mean, it's something that I was... Reading it again, I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, this is so surprising that they did this. I feel like this wouldn't really be done in a comic today. And I feel like they won't do it in the show. I think it's too uh, controversial. And it really, it points to just how much uh, the country's changed in the last 10 years. Yeah. The the culture, whatever. Um, Because this... This would be controversial if this issue came out today. Yeah, I mean, they have that moment on the bus where she's kind of pondering her skin tone and why the white lady won't sit down when there's a seat. And like, okay, okay, fine. But then, you know, later when they get into trouble and just kind of turn back into the white selves so they're okay, that's just, you know, all sorts of fucked up. Plus, like, cops may be going after a black girl, you know, for what happened, you know. Yeah, I think it's well done. It's well written. It's well drawn. I think they did it responsibly, Justin, to your point for the time. Yeah. But it is, yeah, it absolutely, it's it's funny to read this and be like, oh, no, that wouldn't happen now. <laughs> you wouldn't be allowed yeah. to do that. Yeah, uh, I imagine but, when they were working on the show and they read this, they were like, whoo, we have to not do this on the television show. <laughs> Um, But it's still a very good issue. We get to see Dodge become a woman again and uh, trick these two dudes who work at the asylum into showing her the door to Aaron Voss's room so that she can use the anywhere key to get there. Uh, And they do ultimately sneak in. Kinsey uses the head key to peek around in Aaron's head while Dodge is right behind her. And she discovers she's been saying white, 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 because there's nothing in her head. And in fact, the yeah. only thing she remembers is Rendell with a heart and Dodge with the Omega key and what literally is happening to her right at that moment. Yeah. But the interesting detail that we've talked about before, which I think is such a smart move and such a potent move that they make with the head key that they underline here is that even if your memories are totally cleared out, there are still things that you hold on to that are intrinsic to your being. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like uh, Inside Out, the movie mm-hmm. Inside Out, the Pixar sure, movie, yeah. where there are things that become sort of your core memories. Uh, and that that's what the head key is reminding me of a lot. This read of it where it is there are things that sort of transcend and can't be wiped away to your point Alex because they do become sort of wrapped up in your DNA. Yeah. Uh any yeah, other thoughts have, about this issue? Oh, go ahead Pete. Uh, we all have angry little Lewis Blacks in our head. <laughs> yeah. Uh well I do want to say one other thing like I know we talked about how like this wouldn't be made today but it is responsibly done and I will say there are some th- things of the story that are valuable that I wish we were telling uh, in our stories now of like, Mm -hmm. actually, I feel like 
we deal with race and racism in such a sort of caricaturistic way. Um, and we don't actually get to get into the nitty gritty of it because it's such a touchy subject. And this story sort of touches on some things in that way where I'm like, ah, it's it's reductive in some ways. But in other ways, it gets mm-hmm. to deeper points that we don't have anymore because everyone's so nervous. Well, I think if anything, you can tell this story, but it would probably need to be. Uh, a team almost entirely uh, African-American or Af- African descent. And a lot of stories like this from teams like that will go even harder on it. Like I'm thinking about black, yeah. uh, which is a superhero yeah. series that we've had that team on our show a couple of times. And they're like, hit it really fucking hard. Uh, or what, what's the series about magic? The uh, excellence. Excellence, Excellence. yes, which is about sort of like a a group of magicians who work in secret. It's like Harry Potter, but super hardcore. And that's the same thing where both of those titles like go very hard on race. But I think something where it's like this, again, 10 years difference, but something like this that feels like kind of musing on it in, again, a smart and responsible way doesn't work as well as a team who knows that experience and hits it hard. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to talk about the third issue, which is February, which is another super fun structural issue as Uh. they work their way through the month of February. It is a leap year. A fun detail about this, the calendar, the last number is covered, uh, but fans figured out that just based on the dates that the only year it could be is 2012. I don't think that really matters necessarily, but if you want to imagine that this series takes place set in 2012, I think that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's no fine. problem with me. Uh, uh, but it I, is I, this issue is one of my favorites of the series uh, as well. Yeah, it's like, great. Just so good. Yeah. Uh, and this is another one because it's just like them rattling through as many keys as possible because Dodge ends up attacking them on the weekends with a different key each time. And it feels like it could be six different issues. But again, going back to this interview, uh, Gabriel Rodriguez, I think, said they didn't want to do a key of the week format. They didn't want to do a procedural type thing. So this was their effort to be like, ah, here's here's as many keys as we can think of. Just throw it in here. Pete, what do you think about this issue? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just I just think it's done in such a creative way. And again, a tip of the hat to them realizing we don't want to be this. We want to be better than that. We want to try to push things and creatively try to tell stories in a way that's surprising to us, the reader, that's already so many issues in. It's so impressive how creative they are with each and every uh, each and every issue. When I love the way they sort of just hit us with all these keys and then move past them. It's just yeah. opening up the arsenal of keys on the table and just leave us wanting like, wait, what is that one? What's that plant key that just grows face vines everywhere? And we don't ever, I don't think we ever see it again throughout the entire series, but then the angel key, for instance, comes in super handy and the Hercules key and the giant yeah. key. Uh, it's great. Yeah. The giant key is hilarious. Uh, when we, how we see that. We're playing with cars. That's just hysterical. And I think easy isn't exactly the right word because obviously it would be a lot of work, but it would almost be easy to have uh, 29 pages and each one is just a splash page with a different key or something like that. Just to have a fun one off yeah. issue. But this is also a huge issue for the emotional development of all yeah. of the characters. And ultimately, this ends up being one of the most important issues just in terms of this is the one where Tyler starts to figure out wait a second, Dodge is only attacking us when Zach isn't here. That's weird. And he starts to put things together in this issue. But let's talk through some of the stuff that happens. Also, he gets a hat back. Well, he He gives up the hat. I think that's that's the emotional arc for me for this one. It's like uh, the locks are in love. Um, Tyler sacrifices his hat, which is um, the symbol of his heritage and his father uh, for the sake of his girlfriend. Um, and this dude, Brinker, who uh, plays an important role later here. Kinsey is uh, showing everybody the keys. Um, Bodhi shows his friend the giant key. 
So the world and the keys are expanding hugely in this issue. But then by the end of it, it sort of all gets locked back down to our core group of people. And they're back on there. So that Tyler's like the loner sort of dealing with his shit. Kinsey's back in her head a little bit. And then Bodie, same thing. They have to be back on track. So it's a great sort of sad arc that both expands the universe, but then contracts it back to sort of the fighting squad. One of my favorite details with the Kinsey storyline in particular is just the level of metaphor that they use in terms of the magic of the keys, where what she wants to do first with Zach, because she's dating Zach, uh, and then ultimately with uh, Scott and Jamal, is take one of her happiest memories using the head key, put it in their heads, and vice versa. And it works as this fantastic double metaphor for just kids experimenting with drugs or kids experimenting with sex or whatever you want to put on there. And it leads to, like, first, Zach being like, I don't know, I'm not comfortable to take that step. Of course, he has a secondary objective, which is like, don't go in my fucking head and find out that I'm Dodge. Um, right. But with Scott and Jamal... Scott thinks I'm special. Kinsey wants to trade memories with me. She wants to take out my fear. She trusts me with this stuff. And then he discovers her and Jamal are doing memories. And they're like, whatever, we're just having a little bit of fun. But to Scott, it actually means something more. Oh, yeah. I love that. Crushing. Like, I, I just, yeah, I love. You love that seeing level. him get his heart crushed? That's what you're saying? You I love, love that, that level of metaphor. I love metaphors. The oh, only thing I love oh. is metaphors, not people. Wow. Yeah. Explains a lot. Wow. Um, the other thing, I mean, this must have been Pete's. Uh, Pete, you must have loved this at the end. Um, they've been through the emotional ringer, but they're sort of stronger for it, tougher. And yeah. we see Tyler, who was just wearing the Hercules key, which makes you three times as strong as your normal self. And he just sh- destroys some hockey players on the ice in the very <laughs> Hell end. Hell yeah. Yeah, classic. All three of the lock kids being super irresponsible with keys. Uh, don't trust them with secrets. Uh, two things that I wanted to call out that I thought were fun details. Uh, one, on the Friday the 17th paddle, we get the acorn key and a bunch of squirrels, and there's a squirrel pointing to the Omega key, which is, I think, my favorite paddle in the entire issue. It's just so yeah. ludicrous and fun. Uh, and then on the next page, on the 20th, we get another one of those comic book references where Jordan is turning and looking directly at the reader and says, Professor Cordwell is a fucking bitch-ass dyke, which is a riff on the classic Kitty Pride cover saying Professor X is a jerk. Uh, and I yeah. love that they just amp it up exponentially for Jordan. That's so much fun. Um, yeah. So I love those like little Easter eggs there that it's almost like showing their comic book bona fides in a certain way. It's being like, yeah, we yeah. know this stuff. We got this stuff. We understand it. Uh, the other big thing that happens emotionally is Jordan ends up cheating on Tyler with the lacrosse dude, Brinker. 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 Uh, Brinker. And... She does it because she kind of wants to hurt herself, right? And kind of drive Tyler away. Is that what you take away from it? Yeah. It feels like Tyler's getting too close and she um, just doesn't, can't have, that's more threatening to her than, uh, than anything. Because you have Brinker sort of giving that word. Like, why would you do that? Are you trying to crush him? And she sort of silent, her silence makes me think it's a yes. Um. As far as uh, you talked about the squirrels being your favorite, the killer killer teddy bears was was one of my favorite panels. And, and that's the hilarious difference between you and me, Pete. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> one other thing about that, these like you were saying, Alex, um, the way that all the characters sort of hurt each other in this issue is more uh, sets them up to be the heroes they need to be as the series goes on. Mm -hmm. And it's not Dodge who's hurting them. It's casual teenage situations that are really crushing them and getting them ready to face Dodge, just basically growing up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on to the fourth issue, which is called Casualties. And this is another one that plays with form. Great issue. Horrifying yeah. issue focuses uh, turns the focus to Rufus, uh, who we haven't seen in a little while here. Uh, and the thing that happens with the forum is we get a little bit of those old haunted tank Sergeant Rock type comics from DC Comics, where you see these war comics because he plays with these soldiers. So we get to see things from Rufus's perspective as they are menaced by Dodge. 
we uh, find out that Sam Lesser is still around in his ghost form. And not only that, is able to take the form of a army general or sergeant or whatever it is and talk to Rufus. And Rufus is able to talk back to him. Um, yeah, why can Rufus um, talk and see and talk to ghosts? Because he's, he's, he's just... It's kind of like that whole uh, Beetlejuice thing where Lydia's life is darkness and she can see, like, because Rufus is a little different, like, he notices things other people don't notice. I mean, I think that's what it comes down to is, to put it bluntly, I think it is because he is autistic that the reason you can't put the head key in him is because his brain works in a different way. He thinks a different way. And I think it's the same thing with the ghosts is he is able to see things like Pete is saying that other people are are not. Um, And it's funny to me that where the skin key doesn't quite work, I feel like this works okay to me. Like this, yeah. this skirts a line in a certain way where you could be like magical autistic kid, but I don't think that's what they're saying here. It just, it gives him different powers. Yeah, I, I agree. And also he's still written like a, he's not, it's not a condescending take on what he is. No. Like mm-hmm. he is truly the key to defeating Dodge. Uh, Spoiler, dude. As Jesus. we'll learn later. Like, well, he has been like, we know that he's a powerful figure because he's the one that knows Dodge's secret. He's the only one. He's ahead of every other character in the, in the book when everyone looks at him as if he's behind them or behind them mm-hmm. because of the way he is. So it, it's great. And he's also written so well in that he plays with his action figures like like I did. Like, I, like it really takes you yeah. back to like just being so into like creating that world. And that's his whole world. Yeah. Uh, so over the course of the issue, he pals around. Uh, we get to see a horrifying visual of Dodge watching them using mm-hmm. a, a scope. And the scope is showing him an ally who is now an enemy. I think that's the way they phrase it. And he's very confused. He's like, wait, an untrustworthy ally, untrustworthy ally. He's like, Rufus, when were you my ally? But it turns out it's actually looking at Sam Lesser and Sam Lesser knows all about this. Uh, And ultimately Sam reveals that if you throw Dodge back into the well house, he will disappear because really all he is, is an echo. That's it. Uh, this leads to some horrifying things that happen. Um, I did want to call out one of my absolute favorite pages. I'm always a sucker for this, but we get a cross section of key house oh, as yeah. everybody's in there. I love a good, again, like, I think this is a very clear comic book reference because you used to back in the day, get like, here's the Baxter building. Here's a cross section. You can see kind of the fantastic oh. four around or Avengers mansion or something like that. And here we get to see what everybody's doing, where Bodhi is playing with his action figures. Uh, Kinsey is making some tea. Uh, Nina is having Tyler pour out all her liquor bottles because she can't do it herself. Uh, And meanwhile, uh, Rufus and Sam are wandering through the house. And this all leads to... uh, Well, it doesn't happen in this issue, but uh, Zach really suspects what's going on and ends up taking Rufus home and threatening him and threatening his mom. And he breaks his action figure in half. And then right at the end, we get a scene of Brian waking up. And when Brian wakes up, uh, he finds out that the two women who ran him over the car are probably going to be arrested and thrown away in jail. He says, good, fuck him. What about the kid with the gun, the kid in the kitchen? And Duncan says, what kid? And that's the note we end yeah. on, adding it to the last issue, two issues, which are huge. But any yeah, other bonkers. thoughts about any other thoughts about casualties before we get to detectives part one and two? Yeah, uh, the the full page breakdown that you talked about liking so much, uh, sort of the uh, Wes Anderson esque uh, thing. I think he used that a lot in his movies. It really sets the stage and signals that like we're setting up for a big battle in these last two issues. I thought that was just such a smart, subtle way to be like, "Hey, pay attention, shit's happening." Um, I also like that Tyler has to hide um, the most important key, the wine cellar key from Nina, uh, which I thought was. An interesting use of a real life key that is just as important to the survival of the Locke family is making sure Nina can't get access to alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the way Sam gives us sort of uh, a really nice, succinct breakdown of what is going on that the keys are the weapons and also the prize for this series. Um, 
that dovetails nicely with uh, something we'll talk about in the next issues, the big lesson that Tyler learned before that plays um, in the final confrontation here. Um, and then this is just a disastrous issue for the good guys. Like we watch Bodie accidentally expose Rufus to Zach. Uh, Kinsey gets back with Zach, and then we finally get the win at the end, the one crack in Zach's facade with Brian. Yeah, I would just like to say the art from with the army guys transitioning back into what's happening is so much fun. And then having like the evil glowing eyes for when they're being watched. Just uh, again, just the artistic choices are, are just fantastic. Yeah. All right. Let's get into these last two issues here that are so crucial, starting with detectives. Part one, uh, this is what I guess we can call the fencing issue, uh, because yep. it does start off with a guy saying, on guard, pret, allez. And as we see that, we get to see the three atrocities that we've already seen Dodge commit in the series, in addition to everything else that he's committed before. Uh, but then it jumps over to the hospital. And the thing that is so fun about these issues in particular, which we touched on earlier, is they talk about trying to track down Dodge or whoever Dodge is. And Duncan's like, it's not like we're detectives or anything, but that is exactly what Tyler is doing. Like he's not a detective, but he's a smart kid. We've seen him as a meathead in certain ways over the course of the series, but he, I'd argue almost more than any of the other kids has grown in significant ways from where we first found him. And you can tell because he's wearing glasses now. Yeah. That's how you know somebody is smart, right, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right, Justin? A stupid old good eyesight Justin. <laughs> My eyesight's getting better, I just want to say. The eye doctor told me that. Eventually not I might true. not have to wear glasses anymore. No, it's have true. you been juicing? Alex, you juicing? Yeah, I inject a bunch of steroids right into my eyes. That's why they're so bustly. Yeah, it's oh cool. It is. You have a very like muscular weightlifting That's not how eye. How eyes work? They don't get better. They do though. Mine are getting better. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, uh, love so, the love a great takedown of the Eagles right at the top. Um, yeah. With, uh, so Brian, well, Brian oh, reminds me take- of a young Ed Asner. Anybody else? Ed Asner. Do you yeah. know what he reminds me of in this issue in particular? I thought he was like the Wolverine of this series a little bit. Maybe it's the sideburns. But yeah. I feel like he likes to drink. He likes getting into bar fights. He likes wrestle it up. He's got weird hair. And uh, he doesn't take guff from nobody. There you go. Pete, Pete. is he the Wolverine? No, he's, he's short. Not. He's short. He's short. Pete. You like a good short Wolverine, Pete? He's got too many chins to be Wolverine. Let's move the fuck on. Well, it doesn't have a healing factor, bro. So, you know, shut up. Well, the, uh, the uh, lesson I was talking about a minute ago in the last issue that Tyler learned from, uh, I mentioned this last episode in Head Games about how it doesn't, the keys are, are fallible. They, uh, you can lose. The cheat of putting a book in your brain feels like it's working. Um, we, Kinsey's like, hey, just, uh, just put the information in your head rather than actually thinking it through. And he's like, no, you have to go through things. The keys are a shortcut and they're useful, but you actually have to do the work. And that's what, uh, I think that's the most important thing he, he learns for the series. Yeah. So, uh, the middle point, as we mentioned, is this fencing match that happens. There is a lovely bit of dialogue that is so much fun that happens here. As Tyler is slowly starting to put the clues together, he's got that calendar where he's figured out, wait a second, Dodge only attacks on the weekends or these other days. Uh, And while Tyler is sitting there and watching the fencing match, which is Zach versus somebody else, Two people are talking. One of them is Scott. I don't know who the other one is, uh, but they say, look, he doesn't even need to parry. Dodge, dodge, dodge. All Zach does is dodge. And then Scott says, he's a slippery ranker. All right, I'll give him that. At which point Tyler gets up and goes to leave because that I think is like, that's all he needed. This plays to me like the thoughts that are happening in Tyler's head as he's like, you could almost see the figure, the, whatever that gif is with the figures in front of the lady as she's putting them together. That's exactly yeah. what's happening with Tyler at this point. It's almost like a, a scene from an like an airplane movie or like a, mm-hmm. one of the a parody movie where like everything's falling into place uh, in front, like Dumb and Dumber esque. Very funny. Yeah, and Tyler is being smart and careful here. He goes with Bodie 
takes the broken action figure back to the Whedon's place and says, oh, we just need to return this to Rufus. Is that okay?" He asks Ellie a very straightforward question about what was it like when he was a little boy about Zach. Was he always a sweet talker? Did that happen later? And Ellie just pauses and says, are you sure you don't want a cookie yourself, Ty? And that's, I think, all the evidence that he really needs to be like, her memories have been fucked with. Zach is Dodge. We're in serious trouble. Uh, but Zach yeah. figures it out at the same time. Uh, he finds. So I, I have a question, actually. My ah. question is, there is a jar there full of memories of uh, of different uh, Dodges. Who is this yeah. from? Is this from Ellie or from somebody else? Kinsey. Uh, Lucas. Kinsey? It might be him taking out pieces of Lucas uh, so that he doesn't have to deal with them and he can go do his horrible shit. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Just because it's different iterations of Dodge, um, I don't know. I was just a little unclear on exactly who it was. But It could also uh, be that maybe he collects other people's memories of him because he's yeah, always he's pulling kind of going him. around, yeah. you know, and taking people's uh, memory of him. A little vanity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think probably a lot of them are Ellie because the bloody lady Dodge that we saw before was the one that crawled into her head. And it's certainly possible she's seen him with all of those keys. Why he's saving them, though, is another question. When we find out earlier in the volume that uh, Kinsey's fear and sadness have drowned to death uh, in the bottle that she kept them with because the sadness cried so much that it drowned them. Uh, But then Tyler gets stopped by the music box key which is something that we saw teased in the February issue. Uh, Tyler reveals how he figured it all out, at which point we end the issue with Detective Mutuku coming to the door, once again on the brink of being able to save everybody. Uh, And he seemingly has figured things out as well, but we don't know how, which is when we get to the biggest, most important issue of the series, which is Detectives Part 2, the sixth issue of Keys to the Kingdom. One last thing I will say. I was le- on this reread. I was legit tearing up when Rufus said we're in an enemy territory. Yeah. That, it's so, yeah, it gets, the Rufus gets me every time. And just the way that uh, this series, like, just it, everything just unfurls so quickly, like uh, everything flies off the rails and all of a sudden all the status quo of like this entrenched battle between everyone and all of a sudden it's all in the public right away. Yeah. Like so good. It is, I will say, to jump ahead a little bit, <laughs> reading, getting to the end of this volume again, it's insane to think like, oh, my God, there are two more volumes left. Because this feels like there is one issue left of the series at this point. But there's not, and they don't pad it out either. Like Clockworks, which is the next volume, and Alpha and Omega, which is the longest volume of the series, are huge, and huge things happen throughout. Uh, But that's, again, like you guys have been saying, the strength of the storytelling throughout. Um, Yeah, great. All right, let's get to it, Zobs. Let's fucking get to it and deal with it so we can move the fuck on. Wow, Pete, so angry. Um, But I I did want to say from uh, uh, Recap Page Island, since you guys are reading the trades, um, this is where the Recap Page transitions in this issue from the sort of status quo one it's been for a while with Uh the the phrase, today everything changes. So this is like, even in in the original reading of the series, a flag was put in this issue to be like, Buckle up, we're entering the next phase. Yeah. So here we go. Detectives Part 2, issue number six. Uh, Let's just uh, slowly go page by page through here and see what's going on. So the first (laughs) page, uh, we get a horrible setup where Bodhi, like this whole issue, I will say, in all honesty, is absolutely fantastic. Like my stomach was in knots. I knew exactly what was going to happen. But reading it again, it's just absolutely horrifying because they start with this flash forward of blood on skates. We see two doctors saying, charge, clear. Is he dead? Kinsey says, is he dead? And we see Zach taking Bodhi uh, and say, Bodhi is saying, no, please, please don't. And Zach says, shut up. This will all be over soon. And so you start in the... Most Uh, horrifying place possible. It ends in an even more horrifying place, which is the crazier part. It's horrible. It's perfect and horrible. And it's so stressful the way they do those high tension flash forwards. Yeah. Yeah, But what's weird is they have this like unlikable character in the middle of it that really pulls you out of the story. This Dr. Zelvin guy that is just so clearly not a doctor. 
Uh, so uh, then we get a scene of Dr. Matuku, uh, Detective Matuku, uh, who is starting to put it all together, figuring out, uh, finding out that there's an accident and other things have been going on in the town, which is really smart. And we find out uh, that is probably how he ends up at this door, though we do get to see a little bit later. And then let me just flip this page here. <laughs> flip. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that over there. Who's that guy? Who is that? Wow, <laughs> oh, man. Wow, character five to the century. Listen, I mean, there's been, I'd say conservatively up to this point, this is published, what, a hundred years of the comic book form in various iterations? I mean, there was the Yellow Kid, there's Superman (laughs) action comics, there's Batman was introduced uh, in Detective Comics, of course, there's Spider-Man was introduced in Marvel and really launched Marvel, and then it was all April 27th, 2011. Oh, my God. All leading up to this, the character find to the century, the thing that, you know, you read a lot of interviews about comic books. But people always call back to this issue and say they were inspired by this character that we meet here. And it's really kind of wonderful to see over the intervening nine years how the comic book forum has changed since then. Uh, Shut the Mar- fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. I wanted to see how far he was going to go, like how <laughs> no, long he was going to go. Stop. Yeah. You're Pete, on uh, for a fucking page. You have another page. five hours, right? Because I have a whole speech and, uh, written out and thank oh yous. There's a couple of people I want to This fucking thank. doctor knows way too much random shit. Doesn't make any sense in the comic. Here, yada, wait, just, yada. Let's move on. I will say this, seeing this page did catch me off guard. In this reread, I was like, oh, right. Um, now, I don't remember, Alex, when you we for, were first reading this, did you know this was coming no, or did you flip? Uh, no, no, uh, not exactly. Like, it was kind of a surprise to me. I think I may be calling out the one person, but I think our old friend of the show, Riley Trahan, wrote me on email or Twitter or something like that. It was like, hey, congrats. Uh, being in Lock and Key. And I was like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And it turned out they had put out the preview pages. And this is one of the preview pages because, of course, you want to really sell the issue and yeah. really get people on board. <laughs> oh my God. But it was one of the preview pages that I was like, holy shit, that's nuts. But I, I don't think I told you guys because I wanted to get your reaction on the show about it. Yeah. Uh, so they put out the preview pages that I think I told either I told you on the show or I showed you on the show or something like that live on the show to get your reactions. And then of course we talked about the issue from there, but no, I did. I had no idea it was happening. It was a very Uh, pleasant, very nice, very honored surprise. It's very cool. Um, Now let me ask you, what do you think? Why is he such a bad doctor? Cause he shows the wrong X-ray. Like what's up with this dude? No, but he, he clarifies the X-rays, right? No, but he shows the wrong one. Well, he shows him both of them. Right, but it's uh, definitely a violation of a uh, patient doctor. You privilege. don't listen. This is to Detective Matuku, who is a good ally of mine. Uh, in I'm sure the spinoff series, it's all about me as a medical doctor, kind of yeah, helping him out. Yeah, what about the PHI? I mean, you know that like that's patients' uh, information is very protected. You can't just go wow. flashing a badge and getting this stuff. Pete dropping I'm, some knowledge. I'm kind of like a rogue doctor, <laughs> like a doctor who does whatever he wants and says whatever he wants, sort of like a real uh, the resident type guy. So if you we went to like if we went yeah, to like house, a morgue, you'd thinking. be the creepy guy at the morgue. No, the cool guy at the morgue. Uh, I'm like the, Dr. Yeah, Zalvin, cool the cool morgue. guy at the morgue. Yeah, <laughs> Cool mortician. Well, let me ask you, at the end of the page, we're uh, yes. left with the idea that Dr. Zalvin might stick his neck out. Do you think he did that? I think so, because there's a lot, as we know from reading Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, there are a lot of different <laughs> things that happen between the paddles of an issue. And as we continue to read these volumes of Lock and Key, I think you could see the machinations of Dr. Zalbin working behind the scenes. Let me throw out there, Alex, um, the idea of between the panels implies there's another panel after these in which (laughs) Dr. Zalbin would return. So I don't Mm -hmm. know if between the panels is really the right choice of words. Well, it's interesting that you say more panels because I got to say, I think... As far as I can tell with my volume, this was the last page of the comic book series. Yeah. yeah it, didn't end here. <laughs> it doesn't and seem so to continue past this. Yeah. There's a bunch of raggedy ends of pages here, but I don't see anything else. All right, come on. We got to get through the rest of the goddamn comic. No, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done with the podcast. Well, <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> That's, it's sort of a last man standing. Uh, well, but, anyway, it was a, it was a great honor to be put in this comic book. I wish you guys could have felt the same honor. I guess we'll too. never know. I guess we'll never know. I guess we'll yeah. never know. Uh, but Matuka uh, starts to put everything together, and uh, then we cut into the present where we find him confronting Dodge. And man, what I love slash hate about what happens next is this is the point where Dodge is like, eh, fuck it. I got this locked up. I don't even care. He rips up Detective Matuku, bites off Ellie's lip, oh, and just man. starts threatening Dodge. Uh, horrifying. Like, the whole thing is absolutely so tensely drawn by Gabriel Rodriguez, so well written by Joe Hill. It's absolutely horrifying. Yeah, totally agree. It's just brutal. You all, like, Rufus, you feel really feel so hard for him. And then the way it goes down... I, it, the fact that we end this issue with uh, with Dodge inside Bodhi, oh. like the most innocent character, just like horrible, and then Kinsey murdering Zach Wells, the husk of Zach Wells, in a uh, like a, it was it was like a slasher movie. Yep. Yeah. So uh, it turns out that Dodge has actually been a step, at least a step or two ahead of them the entire time. Uh, He makes a deal with Sam Lesser to trade bodies. So he gives Zach slash Dodge goes into Bodie's body. Sam goes into uh, Zach's body and Sam immediately tries to betray Zach. And is like, no, you thought I'd let you get away with this. I'm going to throw you through the well house and you're going to be gone forever. And then, Dodge's Bodhi says, no, I'm actually, I've been ahead of you the entire time. I know exactly what's going on. And he has set up the situation so that I think at the very least he knew that Zach would be arrested by the cops and thrown in jail. So Sam would be thrown in jail. But as you mentioned, even worse, Kinji just slices him up with these skates that were set up at the beginning of the volume. We see Kinsey skating. So this whole thing, once again, is beautifully constructed in terms of singular issues that all build up to this epic confrontation. And as you mentioned, Justin, we leave in the absolute worst place possible. Uh, Pete, any thoughts about this one that you want to share? Yeah, I just, I, I just re having to reread it was just, just uh, it's uh, it's so heartbreaking that we're making the wrong choices and we're kind of uh, going down this horrible path. And there was like they do a great job of job of giving you hope and then taking it away. But the way this ends is so intense. And then having to reread it again, I was like, God damn, this is so powerful. Yeah, and this is something we talked about a little bit on the last podcast, but I think we should revisit here. Does Sam deserve this? I, it's hard. I mean, this series, I feel like we were left with sympathy last time we saw Sam when he does battle with Dodge in, as ghosts. Yeah. And then uh, in this issue, the couple back with um, where he talks to Rufus, we're, we're like, oh, yeah, well, he's, a, he's on our side. And then as he's talking to Rufus, you're like, oh, he's still a psycho killer. Like, what are we, what's he doing here? He's, yeah. he's a little threatening. And then here, yeah, I don't know. I don't think you're, I don't feel... I feel like he betrayed them in the end and it was only after his own revenge as opposed to Mm -hmm. trying to do right by the the Locke family. Yeah, I would say Sam deserves this. He deserves this end, but not at the cost of Dodge getting the win. I think that's sort of how it falls out. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Uh, All right. Let's finish this up by unlocking our key moments for Keys to the Kingdom. Pete. You got to, I know you're looking forward to this. Pete, what's your key moment from Keys to the Kingdom? I don't know. I'm going to have to say the key moment. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to say uh, Rufus. Uh, I'm just going to say Rufus is. Um, wow. Really took my answer. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Rufus is what? Yeah. <laughs> well, just Rufus all of it, is just... kind of a casualties issue was like the real key moment for me, like seeing how he works with his army buddies and how this all kind of like he's on a mission and he's kind of working uh, and doing stuff as well. There is we didn't mention this, but there's a panel where Rufus says, I need to stay with my mom when everybody all goes goes off to Key House. And Uh, Ellie is there. Her bottom lip has been bitten away. But Rufus is just kissing her cheek and sobbing. 
And Ugh. it's so horrifying, but just gut wrenching to read at the same yeah. time. So sad. Uh, Justin, you were the same. Also, just Rufus, same issue. Well, uh, I would throw my key moment um, is just Dodger's ability to uh, to literally dodge um, ev- all these <laughs> attacks against him and still come out with eke out a win despite all of the everything against him is sort of the key to the series. The fact that he keeps finding a way to win uh, thus far into the story is is amazing, and it's what allows the story to unspool the way that it does. So Dodge at the end of this last issue was brutal, devastating, but uh, perfect for the story. As for my key moment, ah, it's oh, really boy. it's really hard to choose. There's so many good moments throughout this volume. Uh, there's, of course, the Sparrow issue, which is one of my favorite of all Alex, time. Alex, you know what the word key means, right? Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to think. What what's the most crucial point in the entire series? I guess I'd have to say the introduction of Doctor Zalbin. The but, but character. Let me, just, let me just say real quick, Alex. A <laughs> uh-huh. key means like it's uh, essential. Like you right. need a key to insert into a lock to open the door. You can't unlock a lock with like a Twinkie. And mm-hmm. Doctor Zalbin is a Twinkie. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, oh, how you feel about that? He just called uh, you a pretty Twinkie. good because. Here's the thing. Twinkies will live for fucking ever, you <laughs> assholes. <laughs> wow. wow. All I have to say about that is, although there was a great deal of trauma to the rest of the body, this is the cause of death. A, a torsional break of the second and third critical oh, vertebrae. Stop. In layman's term, the head got twisted halfway around. Nasty. You're, you're great. Right. What a read. Doctor. What a way to bring the character to life. We should definitely, if there are any other characters in this story that we know... We well, should have them read their panels aloud. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if something like that happens, like, you know, I mean, but that would be a one in a million chance, like a huge boulder falling on you, right, Justin? I, I mean, I don't understand that metaphor because boulders are known to not kill. <laughs> that They're is ridiculous. To be very survival. You're not even talking to the microphone at this point, just talking to them. What are you doing? You're just looking down. Yeah, yeah, I'm on my phone. You know, I got other things to do than sit there listening to <laughs> jerk each other off. Why are you so? I feel like you're like a a, a father or who has forced to spend time with his children. <laughs> Dad, get off yep. your phone. We're talking about stuff we all have an interest in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much all for listening. If you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the People's Improv Theater Loft in New York. Come on by. We'll definitely chat with you about Lock and Key. If you want to chat with us socially, Lock and Key Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can subscribe and listen on iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice. Uh, also, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast. Podcast and more. And if you want to lock up great medical benefits, <laughs> be sure to come down to Dr. Zalbin. Oh we'll fix your God. spine ASAP. Wow, a crooked doctor. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs>